Okay, you have to look at Mama's. You have to look at the phone. Here we are. At home. In our living rooms. With our families. With those we love. Today, wherever you are located, know that you are not alone. You are not alone. We're still connected. Today, we gather as one body. One body. One body. Because the church is not a building. It never has been. It never has been. We gather today as one church. One church. To lift up one name. The name of Jesus. 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 So wherever you are, today is the day the Lord has made. Today is the day to give him thanks. So let's unite. Let's worship. Let's praise his name. For he is worthy of it today and every day. Because we are still the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Hello church, family and friends, it's Pastor John coming to you from my office this morning and I'm ex excited to have the opportunity to share with you a message from 1 John chapter 5. This will be the last message in our series on 1 John and we pray that it has been a blessing for you as it has been for Brother Rick and myself as we've prepared for these messages. When these messages started back in February, uh, actually it was on the 23rd of February, the world looked a lot different than it looks right now. We had just finished up a sermon series on having 2020 vision for the year 2020. And as you kind of sit back and look at it and think about it, who could have really seen what was coming? It's been a wild ride over these last few weeks. But we are truly grateful uh, that the Lord has given us His grace and the ability to persevere and go through these hard times. Um, today, as we finish this last section in 1 John, we're going to see that John's going to give us a few different uh, kind of aspects or a few different uh, topical things that we can take away from these verses and from this chapter that's going to hopefully give us some encouragement. In fact, uh, the first part of 1 John chapter 5 is going to start with an encouragement. And then we're going to move into uh, a portion of reassurance about who the Lord is and what it is He's doing in our lives. And then He's going to finish up with a reminder about why it is that He wrote this letter in the first place. So why don't we dive on in and uh, just see what John the Apostle has to say about the person that he probably knew better than anyone else did, his good friend, his master and savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's start with this portion of encouragement. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, we're going to see that John is talking to or talking about a group of people and he's going to say that these people are overcomers. Like they have overcome the world. Let's look what it says. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. There it is. We're overcomers. We overcome the world if we are born of God. And then he asks a few questions. He says, And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And then he says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So he's, he's basically saying there's, there's a group of people that have overcome the world. And there's really not another group. It's really just these people. Who else is it that overcomes the world except for those who believe in Jesus Christ? Except for those who have a relationship. So he's going to say here in, in 1 John chapter 5, 1 through 5, that there's this group of people that are overcomers. And here are, here's their qualifications, or here are those things that are common to this group of people. Number one, it says that they are born of God. They've made Jesus Christ their personal Lord and Savior. They have received the good gift of God. They've re received the Spirit of God in their life. Then he says that these people 
who believe in God and have become uh, children of God share this love from God. Like there's fruit that is evident in their life because of their relationship with Jesus. The love of God is shown in the way that they live. And then he says that there's another way to tell a person who is an overcomer in the world. And that is the fact that they obey the commandments of God. They, they love to do the things that please the Lord. So he says not only do they do the commandments but the commandments are not burdensome to them. They love to do the things that please the Lord. And I think the further and the more uh, in-depth our relationship with the Lord grows over time, that should be said of us, that we want to do the things that please the heart of God and that we want to shun the things that we know hurt the heart of God and separate us from, from God. So it also says that there's this victory that we have and the way that we know or the thing that we trust in or the reason that we have this victory that's overcome the world is our faith, our faith, what we believe about God. And scripture tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight. So it may be the case right now that you find yourself on this day where you're watching this message not feeling like an overcomer. You might say, hey, I don't look like an overcomer this morning. I've got my sweatpants on or my moo and I haven't put my makeup on and, you know, I'm eating cereal, watching the sermon. Uh, maybe, you've, maybe you've struggled with finding connection in this time. You just can't come to terms with what it is the Lord has called you to do during this time of uh, separation from other people. So maybe you don't feel like an overcomer. But I want to encourage you today that you're not an overcomer because you feel like it or because you've done enough or that uh, you're good enough. You're an overcomer today because of what Jesus has done, because of what he has uh done for you and what he has made you you're an overcomer today and i want you to know that above all else so uh it's it's kind of my my desire this morning to encourage you in that so maybe you're sitting with someone today listening to this message or maybe you've got headphones you know in and you're listening to it yourself um Maybe fun to just kind of freak somebody out and say, hey, did you know that you're an overcomer? Did you know that I'm an overcomer? Why don't you encourage one another with these words? You are an overcomer. In 1 John 4, 4, it tells us that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. I hope that's encouraging to you today because I know there's a lot of things that are going on around you that don't feel very encouraging And I know that you probably don't feel like you're an overcomer, but today you're an overcomer. If you, if you meet these qualifications, you are an overcomer in the Lord. Okay. So on to the second point point or the, the second, uh, portion of scripture it's from first John chapter five and it's, uh, verse six through 12. Now, what John is going to do in this portion of Scripture is reassure people about the one that they put their trust in. So he's going to speak candidly of Jesus, and he's going to do it in a way that very few people ever could. John can have this conversation, and he can talk about Jesus on this level because John knew Jesus in a way that no one else did. So he's going to talk about three aspects of the testimony of Jesus that should give you confidence in who he is and who you are in him. So here they are. In verse 7, he tells us these three things. He says, um, where are we at? So he says, there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that He has borne concerning His Son. 
This is the testimony that God has given us through his son. These three things. Let's get into them just a little bit. The first, he says, there's the water. So the water's speaking of the baptism of Jesus. And whenever we look at baptism, we understand that it's not the act of baptism that saves us or cleanses us. In fact, Jesus here at his baptism obviously didn't need to be washed of anything. He was sinless and he was perfect. He never did anything in his life that was opposed to the will of God. So there was nothing that he needed to repent from and there was nothing he needed to be cleansed of. But the thing that makes this testimony important is that Jesus was baptized as an act of obedience. And he was also baptized as an act of setting an example for those that would come after him. So Jesus uh, was, a, uh, was the perfect example. You can remember whenever Jesus came walking down uh, near the Jordan River and John saw him off in the distance and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. There was a time whenever the sacrifice of an animal, a lamb, a bull, a goat, a ram, a bird, whatever it might have been, that the blood covering from that animal would cover sin for a period of time. But John, standing in the water, looks at the Lamb of God, knowing that he will shed his blood and that his blood being poured out will do more than just cover sin for a moment. It will completely forever, for a lifetime and beyond, for eternity, cover the sins of those who will put their faith and trust in Jesus. So the water and the blood agree. So it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Had Jesus not shed his blood on the cross, there would have been no payment for sin. But because the perfect Lamb of God, the Holy One of God, came and shed His blood for you and me, there is a covering for our sin. In fact, Jesus um, completely takes away our sin. And He paid the penalty for our sin on the cross by His blood. And then the third thing that it says that agrees with the water and the, and the blood is the Spirit. Listen to this verse from Romans chapter 8, 15 through 17. He says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption of sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Spirit of God that has been given to us bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, that we're no longer slaves, that we're, we're no longer outcast, no longer marginalized. We are, um, we are worth something. We are valuable. We have hope. We have life. In fact, we've been put in a, into a relationship with the Father God where He loves us. And He no longer, no longer says that, that we are slaves, no longer says that, uh, that we need to be in fear of Him. He says, you can call me Father. And that's what He's calling us to do today. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, Jesus, whenever he was about to go to heaven after he died and rose again, whenever he was going to ascend into heaven, he told his disciples there in John 14 and there um, 12 through 14 in John, tells them that he's going to send a helper, a comforter that's going to lead and guide the disciples after he leads that the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of Jesus, is going to inhabit the people of God. That our bodies are going to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, the residing place of God. So John says that these three things agree. The water, 
the blood, and the Spirit. And they agree to make this uh, assurance to you that Jesus is a safe place to put your trust and to put your hope. In fact, he says there is none other that we should trust in. Don't trust in the systems of the world. Don't trust in, the, in, uh, in men and what they can give you. We, we put our trust in God and we are overcomers in him because of the faith that we have in him. And then we get to the last portion of, of 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21. And it's the big finish. It's, it's the reminder. He uses a technique that many speakers and many writers use where they're going to tell you at the end what they've told you throughout the whole course of the letter. And basically, he's going to do this with just a few, a few words. And these words stand out to me as something that you could remember. So he says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Here's the words I want you, that kind of stand out to me. And it would be beneficial for you to... Uh, just kind of ponder on them for a minute. And those words are, that you may know. John wrote this letter so that you may know. Now, what is it you need to know? What is it you're supposed to take away? He says, one, that as a child of God, you know that you have eternal life. You know that this life is not the end of life. You know that on the other side of your last breath here is a eternity of joy in the very presence of God, the one who created you. That you may know that there will be trouble in this life, but that as an overcomer in the Lord, the troubles and the things that you face are not insurmountable are not made to overtake you because the the reality of who Jesus is and who Jesus is in you makes you an overcomer you sit on a higher plane in fact it says that we've been seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus that we've been made uh, joint heirs with Christ that although there's trouble and there are things that are happening all around us, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to, we don't have to be overcome by it. The avalanche of emotion and the avalanche of anxiety doesn't have to rest on us because we have one that we depend on. And as we saw in the previous verses, he is trustworthy and He is dependable. He is a safe place for us to put um, our trust in this time. And then in verse 20, it says, Jesus has come to give us understanding so that we might know that He is true. He is the true God and offers eternal life. So, Hopefully you can see, and as we've gone through 1 John, we've seen that there's kind of a pattern. There's this love of God, and it talks about the way that we love God, but it also talks about how we love other people. This is, this is our charge, and this is our uh, assignment as we go away from reading these verses and understanding what John was saying. As children of God, we're going to obey God and we're going to find a way to do that. Or as we, as we uh, grow in God, we're going to see that obeying God is not a cumbersome or burdensome task. And we're going to start to reach out of ourselves. And we're going to look for other people that are hurting. People that don't have the hope that we have. And we're going to love God in such a way that we reach out to other people. We're going to love God in such a way that we lay down our pride and we lay down um, just 
those things that make us uncomfortable. We're going to be willing to walk through some doors of discomfort in order to please God and to help other people. So John always talks about loving God, uh, just, just flat out loving God, uh, worshiping God, seeing who he is and honoring him that way, but also doing that through the life that we live. This is an hour of time where things have just, nobody really knows what's going on. We're all trying to figure out our spot in the world. We're all trying to figure out what it is that we're supposed to be doing. And I know that in, in almost every video that I've shot, I've kind of ended this way, but I, I keep coming back to this because I think it's true. God has given us this time for a reason. There may never be another time in your life that you spend this much time with your kids. May never be another time that you have as much time to spend with God. May never be another time where you have a chance to lay some stuff down you need to lay down and to pick some stuff up you need to pick up. John, through this letter, 2,000 years ago is, an, is encouraging us and he's saying, hey guys, you're overcomers. Through Christ, you're overcomers. He is a safe place for you to trust, and He is a safe harbor for you to rest in. Even though the wind and the waves are rough and rocky and all of those things, He is a safe place for you to go. Remember who He is and remember what He's done. And as you put your trust in Him, and as through your faith you become an overcomer in this life, there are people in your life that need to know this story. There are people that need to know this message. We've been given this charge by Jesus. And now we hear it through his disciple John that we need to take this good gift that we've been given and share it with the world around us. We have hope and we have peace. We have eternal life in God and we are overcomers in this world. I hope that encourages you today. I know that it encourages me. So I know right now we're, we're trying to figure out exactly what's going on with the state opening up and it looks like there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. We just want to let you know that we love you and that we're praying for you and uh, we can't wait until the day that we can all be together again as a church body and just enjoy one another's presence and company. Until that day, we're going to just commit to continue to pray for you. And if there are needs that you have that are unmet, we would love to meet you at that point of need. So please contact the church office if there are things that we can help you with, or maybe you hear of someone who has needs that aren't being met. Um, we would sure love to, as a church body, meet those needs. So we love you. And uh, I'm so grateful that you took these few minutes to uh, spend some time with me. And uh, I hope to see you soon. And I know that Kirk and Rick and Ruth and everyone here at the church is on that same, that same kind of uh, mindset. We're getting sick of each other. We need someone else to talk to. So I hope to see you soon. God bless. Love you.